All right, here we go. Another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Fadi Kudair, local realtor in Ottawa. And this show is all about bringing people here, businesses in Ottawa that, uh, you know, to just shed some light on the city that we live in and what we're all about. And today we are joined by my bromance, the guy, the man, <laughs> Sarwar. And Sarwar is actually a partner at Patterson & Company. Also, Sarwar is in charge of this amazing networking group that I've been part of for the last year or so. It's called Beyond Networking. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great. It's been a while. My wife tells me I talk to you more than I talk to her sometimes. That's, that is actually true. I, I, I've <laughs> just, I was just checking out my text messages, and I think Sarwar and I do at least two to three texts a day. 100%. And that's been going on for about a year now, and I'm loving it. <laughs> I couldn't have like one of the best brothers I've ever gained, to be honest. I appreciate it. Um, with that said, Sarwar, I just wanted to kind of dig in a little bit more about, uh, well, we're going to start off, if you don't mind, with Patterson & Company. Let people know about your firm, what you guys do, how long you've been in business, and what services do you offer? So we're a small boutique accounting firm. Our office is in Westboro, but we can work with people remotely, virtually anywhere. And our sweet spot is small business owners. So someone that has a small business, they could be a dentist, they could be a coffee shop, they could be a, a realtor like yourself. You are my accountant, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so these people have complex business needs and accounting needs and tax needs. Because someone is running a business, Sometimes they're wondering, what can I write off? What can I expense? Mm -hmm. How can I minimize my taxes? And it's something that some people try to do themselves, but it's one of those things that if you don't know, you don't know. And we think we bring a lot of value in helping optimize the tax situation. So our goal is to find some efficiencies and savings and help simplify the process. Some people are worried I'm going to get audited. I'm going to... Yeah. And that, that's, that's really, to be honest with you, I used to do my own taxes for the longest time, but that was always been my biggest fear is what if I get audited? I have no clue where to go back myself up and like what sort of paperwork do I need and all of that. So sometimes we have a saying back home. It says like, you better off give your half the bread to the bread maker and just let it be because at the end of the day, you know, it's going to be done right. That's part of it. There's a peace of mind. There's a quality. And my hope and goal is whatever someone's able to do on their own, we can take that and do it a little better so that our fees are more than covered. So if someone has an accountant, a professional coming in, taking a look at stuff, there's obviously a cost for those services, but that cost is outweighed by the advice and the tax savings that that person can bring to the table. So if that's the case, it's a net win-win. What are some of the tailored to other than, you know, small businesses like realtors and what have you that are specific for you? Yeah, yeah. So I work with a lot of healthcare professionals that varies between dentists, doctors, pharmacists, different healthcare. Those people go through school to become what they are doing. So they go through pharmacy school, dentist school. But once they get out there and they open up a clinic or a pharmacy, they're now a business owner. They have employees, they have overhead, they have yeah. leases. They have cash flow. You know, I'm helping this ph this pharmacist, brand new, just out of school. He wants to open up a pharmacy. He's negotiating with the landlord. He's got this quote to do all the fit ups, do all the the furnishings. Then he has another quote for all the equipment. It's not cheap. You know, all that pharmacy equipment oh, yeah. they got in there, all the inventory, and he's just in a little over his head. You know, in terms of just doing a cash flow breakdown. The bank is obviously there to lend money, but we can kind of step in and do some kind of help from a projections perspective, from a cash flow management perspective, just make sure they're not biting off more than they can chew and going into this in the best way yeah. possible. And I find, maybe I'm mistaken with this, but I find a lot of the young professionals, specifically, you know, the ones that went to school for that specific role, like a doctor, a dentist, or what have you, as smart as they can be when it comes to business, it's sort of like the back seat. They're, they're taking the back seat and that's where you guys can come in and hopefully give them a little bit of guidance on that. Yeah, to, to be honest, it's no different than like, you know, as an accountant, I feel like I'm smart. I studied accounting, I went to university, did all that stuff, but we all have blind spots. Yeah. You know, like when you're good at something, you're good at it. Some people think they're good at everything, which obviously creates blind spots. And some people think like, I'm good at this, so I should stick to this. Mm -hmm. And where I need help, I need help. So, so for example, like, like if I had an issue with my mouth, I wouldn't like go to my bathroom and pull out some tools and start trying to fix it, right? <laughs> I would call my dentist and be like, I hey, hope so. <laughs> right? I'd be like, hey, you know, I got a painful tooth. I got a, 
I gotta come in. Can you see me? And can we, you know, yeah. get the right person looking at this? It's kind of hard to be like. A lot of us want to be kind of the jack of all trades. It doesn't work that way. Like you have to be able to say, look, I'm good at A, B, and C. I'm not really sure about D or Z. I should give it to someone else that knows how to do it. And that's really the essence of this: is that you should be able to outsource. We live in a complex world. Like like a, a good example is we both drove here. Your 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 Volkswagen, my Honda's in the parking lot. Thousands mm -hmm. of people are involved in that process, the supply chain. So so even one product, obviously it's a complex product, but there's many, many people and specialists involved doing what they're good at to get to the final result. So in, in a way, we kind of act as that financial, accounting, tax, liaison, and intermediary and give people that peace of mind. In some ways, it's almost like if you're a small business owner, you have a personal CFO. So big companies have CFOs, small companies usually don't have the size to have one, but people can feel like, oh, I have a CPA, I have a CFO, I can call him, I can call That's her. That's fantastic. I'm going to start introducing you as my personal CFO. Right? It's catchy. <laughs> it's catchy. Hey, this is Sarwar, he's my CFO. Right? Yeah. So it brings me back to just kind of like the, the gist of the business. What are some of the services that you guys deliver to your clients? Uh, that you could say like, you know, item A, B, and C, and, and you know, some of those services that are, not everybody's aware that, you know, accountants do. So for us, the sweet spot is when someone has a small business, they have tax filing requirements. So depending upon how the business is structured, if they're incorporated, they're going to have a corporate tax filing requirement. And then from there, it's like a branch of other additional requirements. So for example, a business owner might have an HST requirement because mm -hmm. they're registered for HST. They might have a payroll requirement because either they're paying some employees or they're paying themselves through a salary and they have these additional forms and, and requirements. So the starting point is figuring out how they're set up. If they're self-employed, they have a personal tax requirement and the self-employed income is there. And then in addition to that, some business owners, when they start to work with banks and other investors and lenders, they have what's called the financial statement requirement. So the lender will say, it's very common with banks, we are giving you a loan for your business, to buy a property, to buy equipment, to buy inventory. In exchange, or in addition to giving you that loan, we would like some financial disclosure on your business yeah. because we just need a little bit of comfort that things are the way they are. Now, if the business owner is sitting here in this seat and you're the bank over there, the bank feels like if you, the owner, give the information to the bank directly, there could be, not to say it's, it's necessary, but there could be some fluffing of the information, yeah. right? Like there could yeah. be some buttering it up, making it look a little bit more rosy, just to get things to meet a certain level to look good, right? Then you qualify for a bigger loan, your business shows a little better than it is. So basically a CPA, which is what I am, acts as that intermediary between the two to say, hey, we want to represent the business owner, they're our client, we have to do right by them. But we have these, we call it financial statement users, and we have to do right by them because they are relying on this information yeah. to make decisions. So it's a bit of a long topic, but then there's different levels of financial statements, which are summarized as audit, review, and compilation that the bank, depending on their needs, will require to say, like, as an example, this is a very complex file, very big loan requirement. We would like an audited set of financial statements so that we feel comfortable with what's going on in this business so that we can lend this big sum of money. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, and we're, we're not using this as like a disclaimer to everybody here. You know, you don't take this as an accounting advice. If you want an accounting advice, you book a time with Sarwar and go from there. <laughs> but with that being said, Sarwar, just tell me a little bit more about some of the structures that you've seen within the small, medium business, like how to set up those businesses, some of those structures that you, you guys have been able to do. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you like a life cycle. Yeah. So someone wants to start a business, they keep it simple. They start off being self-employed. So self-employed means the income your business makes is on your personal tax return. It's great. It's simple. It's efficient. Time goes on. They're making more money from that business than what their personal needs are. So the business is successful. They're making a good sum of money, more than they can spend or more than they need for their personal life, their family. Being self-employed means that person is paying more tax than they need to. So what we do is we come in, we have a conversation with that person, we do some planning and we say, you need to incorporate because the benefit of incorporating is the money you don't need to take out for personal, you will pay a low rate of tax on it. 
corporate small business tax rates are much lower than personal tax rates. So you take this person, maybe they're two, three, four, five years in, they're making a little bit more than they need and it's growing. They're making more and more and more over time. We incorporate them. Now they've benefited from step one or tax deferral, we call it mm -hmm. low small business corporate tax rates. Let's say some more time goes on and they're accumulating a significant amount of money in their corporation. You know, that little bit of amount that they can save every year, it starts to grow. It's 10,000 in year one. In year two, it's 20,000. So now it's 30. Year one, year two. Year three, it's 40,000. So it's 70. And they're like, hey, we have this extra money. It's sitting maybe in a bank account, maybe simple, you know, investments. We want to do something fancy with it. We want to open a new location. We want to buy some real estate. We want to do something fancy. And then we can say to them, hey, we now want to look at a holding company. We want to separate your business operations, and you are, let's use the example of the pharmacist, you are the pharmacist, that's your core business. These investments that you're now getting into, which are more complex, like a property, a commercial real estate, residential real estate, yeah. we want to push that over into a separate entity. That way, the two things are completely separate. You can sell one and not the other. The liability is not cross-contaminated, like something goes wrong here. It's, it's not impacting over here, vice versa. So now we add a holding company which is two separate entities. This one's got the real estate portfolio. This one's got the pharmacy core business operations that they have. And now they have that set up. Time goes on and maybe they want to open another location for the business that they run. So they want to open up pharmacy number two. So now we can set up another company for them, open up another pharmacy. And that's kind of the life cycle that we go on. And then let's say it goes full circle. At some point in time, they want to retire. Maybe they want to sell. We can help them with tax planning at the time of sale. Maybe they have kids that want to enter the business and take over. Very, very common in small mm -hmm. businesses. They have a niece, nephew, child, um, cousin. Someone wants to take over, get into the business, take over. We can help tax efficiently structure that, get that business over so the next generation can kind of continue it. And all along the way, they're making money. As they make money, they ask us some questions about how much money should I be taking out? Should it be a salary? Should it be a dividend? So all those things were kind of like personal CFO helping them with yeah. on, a, on, a, on a journey. You know, some of the clients I've worked with, I've been doing this for 16, 17 years. Some of my clients have been there since day one. So I have a couple clients that, you know, have been there since day one. Some of the clients I've picked up along the way. So they've been there for maybe five, eight, 10 years, but that's the journey. You know, then there's some clients I picked up and they've sold since then, like the, like depending on our ages and stuff like that. So we've kind of seen this life cycle depending on where people are at. And that's very beautiful, you know, and, and you've met some of those people. Oh, yeah. Now, this is one of the reasons why you shouldn't be doing accounting yourself, yeah. right? I mean, it, it's a very small little reason, but it's, it's a big reason at the end of the day. Because if you just don't understand like where you're at in the life cycle and where you're going to be, the tax implications can be huge for you. And it could actually hinder your business instead of bringing it to where it needs to be. The biggest one for me, like just looking at it, sort of forecasting for me would be at one point, I, I would like to leave the business to my, my kids and how, how that's possible. That would be something that we would have the conversation and kind of figure out where that kind of fits in. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about some of the interesting clients that you have and you don't have to tell me names or businesses or anything like that, but just what do they do? And then some of the interesting things that you've seen over the years. Yeah. So one of the interesting ones is, uh, I'll call it clean tech, green tech, you know, like they're trying to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. So I have this one really cool client. They're trying to take dirty water and make it clean. That sounds really simple. They got these PhD people, they got these scientists, they got, you know, a whole bunch of people working on it that when I have meetings with them, some of the stuff, I have no idea what's going on because of how technical it is, but at a core concept, it's basically devices that are trying to take dirty water and make it clean, which to me is huge, yeah. you know, to make the world a better place. Why not? I, I have another client that, you know, how on the roof of your house, you have shingles or now there's steel roofs. They're trying to develop for Canadian climate because it's maybe already in some other climates, but they're trying to create either on the roof or the siding of your house. The material is built in with solar. So it's not like two separate installations of shingles, then solar on top. They want to build a all-in-one solution. So you're not getting two separate products that you get the siding of the building or the, or the structure or the roof of the building has the solar component built into it. Mm -hmm. So those are like the green tech side of things. 
I have some clients that are, you know, real estate to me is exciting. I know you're in real estate. So, you know, sometimes I meet someone and I have this one client, she's in her fifties, maybe sixties. And she said the business was started by her mother who came here from Europe way back when. And, you know, real estate prices have obviously changed since then, but basically her mother would buy a property every year or every two or three years. So she did that for a period of time, passed things on to her daughter when she got older. The daughter kept doing that. And this lady owns like a couple hundred units, doors. You know, some of them are multifamily things. Some of them are uh, individual, you know, single family homes or duplexes. And just going through this portfolio. And she's so unassuming. You would not know that looking at her, right? She still has like this job where like she works. Those are my favorite people, by the way. Yeah, yeah. The she- ones that you're... Totally, you meet them. They're very unassuming. You have no idea what they, what they have in the bank, what's going she's on. She's not flaunting it. She's, she's exactly. very and nice. She's humble. She's personal. She doesn't strike me as someone that's rich and flaunting it yep. or, or that's egotistical or any of those things. She's just a normal person, is, is nice, has a job. So you would think like, okay, this person's doing okay. They have a job. They're doing okay. But then in the back, they have all these properties. Some of them are fully paid off. Some of them are partially paid off. Some of them are refinanced to buy more properties. But the net worth of that portfolio is huge because obviously over time it's compounded and grown and stuff like that. Yeah. And I'm just like, well, a few hundred doors in Ottawa. Like, I mean, even if you look at a rate of 500 K that's yeah. 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 That's a lot of money. So it's sure. like, it's like a hidden gem. It's, it's like, I heard this story, someone passed away and they were a janitor and in their will, they left like millions of dollars to charity and then no one knew, but this person was just very dedicated or, or very disciplined you know, with investing and savings and things like that. So, so in a way it strikes me as that, like even in her age now, she's still trying to keep following the path that she's on, like, like getting a property, adding doors, adding things like, like she's got this formula and it works. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some of the pitfalls for not having an accountant, a good accountant that knows what the heck they're doing? It's really, you don't know what you don't know. So, so one of the issues is you may be missing out on tax savings and you don't know. So what I always tell people is if they meet with me, it doesn't necessarily mean something's going to come out of it and we need to work together. It's really just about assessing if there's opportunities and fit. So it's not like a, a commitment or, or anything formal when we meet. So oftentimes what I try to do is meet with someone and see if there's value I bring to the table. To me, if I find opportunities where I can help them, I basically create like a bullet list Here's some things where we can help. Here's how we would structure it and implement it. If you'd like to work together, let me know. Then they can kind of see, oh, you know, this is how we're going to benefit. Maybe some of those things have immediate tax benefits. Maybe some of those things are long-term benefits. But they can kind of assess what they want to do. If there's nothing, like once I met someone and they were so organized, they did their own taxes. And I was like, dude, like. You're there's there's nothing to break the table here. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, I studied accounting in school as a, as a minor. There you go. I keep on top of everything. It's about time, right? Some people have time to research and look up stuff. And they're like, once I had a question, I called Siri to get the answer. I'm like, like, I can't mess with that. You know, like, like you have everything in place. The only thing I can offer you is if you don't want to have the time commitment of doing this yourself, obviously giving it to someone to do would be yeah. a, a savings of that time, but you're doing it perfectly. Like, like there's nothing I would do differently. So if you want to keep doing it, no problem. So, so that's really, you know, what we try to do. So to me, there's no pitfall in that meeting because we're just trying to find areas because a lot of people, I'm going to say the majority of people, when we have that meeting, they don't know what they don't know. There's, there's, oh, I didn't know I could deduct that or, oh, I didn't know I could do that. or Oh, I didn't know I could save taxes this way. And then that's kind of gets the, the balls rolling or it gets the wheels turning. You know, if, if they don't know, then that might lead to a savings of this amount compounded yearly for yeah. a number of years. You know, we're talking a big thing and that's usually how our conversations start with people. Now, with that being said, a lot of the the time I find when people just kind of go and do their own taxes, like you said, there's a lot of things that they miss out on. What are some of the things that you guys can bring to the table other than just the tax savings from a structure perspective? So one thing that we try to bring to the table is, if someone's in trying to grow the business, the numbers speak a language. So I'll give you a really quick example. I had a client in the food business. This is before COVID. So we're not talking about the COVID restrictions and all that stuff. This is before COVID. 
And their business was in a very central part of the city, very high rent, very expensive, and they were carrying a big area where they were serving food mm -hmm. or, or allowing people to eat. So their, their rent was really high because they had like all these seats. But when we looked at the numbers, we looked at not just sales that they made in total, we looked at the breakdown of sales, which from an accounting perspective, you can break down to every as much detail as you'd like. So I said, what's your dine-in sales? What's your takeout sales? Yeah. What's your Uber and skip the dish and, and third party sales? What's your catering sales? We realized dining sales weren't that great. The people eating in weren't the bulk. And we also realized that when people ate in for lunch, they were working with the budget. You know, when you go out for lunch, if you're going out for lunch every day of the week or a couple of days of the week, like it's 25 like, bucks, that's all I'm going to spend. Right? Yeah. And no, this is a few sense. years ago. So I think back then the, the budget might have been 20 or 15, mm -hmm. right? Before, before, the, before the massive inflation that we had. Yeah, exactly. So we realized the people are coming in just for the bare minimum meal and not getting the upgrades and, and, and it's not a big profit driver. Catering, however, is a lot higher because in that area, there's a lot of businesses. You know, we're talking like a downtown type of area. So when a law firm, a bank, a business caters, they have a big marketing budget. You yeah. know, they're doing a team meeting. They're doing a client presentation. They're getting the full package. They're getting the meal with the chips, with the drink, with the dessert. Well, they, yeah, they want to take care of their employees and it's a tax benefit right off for them anyways versus the individual walking in only spending that 20 bucks. So so we basically had a conversation at, at, at the onset to say like, how do you get these catering clients? And, he, and, and the guy was like, well, sometimes someone will eat here and they'll say their office is close by and they'll, they're having a meeting and if we can cater and we just take it. So it's by chance. So I said, let's try to focus on getting more catering opportunities. Like, let's go through your database and anyone that's ordered from you in the last six months, proactively reach out to them and see, do you have more meetings coming up? Can we cater? And you know, what immediately happened was a couple of the organizations said, you catered something for us. That's a monthly meeting. So every month we have to go and find someone to cater. It's actually a hassle for us. You do it. Would you like to cater the yeah. same thing every month? And the other hassle is when you cater from different places, you have to order again and again. If you do the same thing every month, it's the same order. So they just said to him, I'm not going to use his real name, but let's use the name Mo. Mo, can you just keep our order? And every month, give us the same thing unless we tell you otherwise. He's like, no problem. I have a system. I'll keep your order. So every month, it's like, you know, 12, whatever, half veggie, half chicken, blah, 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 you know, and, and a variety of fruit and stuff like that. So now the, 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 the businesses were happy because they're saving time. His margin started to go up because he was getting more catering. So now he's got a little bit more consistency as well, too, because it, he's got them for the year, at least. Exactly. Exactly. And then... Instead of just focusing on those existing repeat customers, let's proactively get more catering clients by doing like a mail out or a flyer drop off to other businesses yeah. in that area. You know, like, like there's businesses everywhere in downtown, right? So like, let's just drop off some flyers. Let's do some door knocking. Let's you know go see some receptionists and have someone uh, kind of chat them up for five minutes. You know, I, I know you had Hussein. Hussein is the ultimate door knocker. Door knock? <laughs> yes. Box of Timbits. You know, so, so, so I said, you know, door knock. A little sample of your uh, of your cuisine. That's it. And then that's, you know, get the receptionist kind of uh, warmed up to you. And then, you know, hopefully they reach out, leads to a couple of uh, follow-ups. So, you know what ultimately ha ended up happening? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of condensing the story now. Is they realized catering was a lot more profitable. They realized dining was less profitable. So, when time came up for lease negotiations, they kind of cut their space down a little bit. Mm -hmm. They said, you know, because you know in those plazas, they have different size spaces. They said, well, sh we'll... we'll maybe cut down some of our our um, eat-in area because it's not that profitable or as uh, as important. But we still need to be downtown because that's where people want to see us because that's they feel comfortable knowing we can deliver yeah. from that location. So we're not going to go to like a, you know, a business park or out of that core, but we don't necessarily need to carry this much overhead. So they changed the, the setup of their business mm -hmm. altogether and their business became way more profitable, right? They're paying less on overhead, less on rent. They're selling more catering, which is more profitable. So it, it, it's like this example, if, if I was to use numbers, it's like if you sell a million dollars worth of stuff, but it costs you nine, 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 nine to, 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 to deliver and make yeah. it, you only make a dollar. Exactly. Even though it sounds nice to be able to say, I have a million dollars of sales, people are like, oh, we have a million dollars of sales. 
Now, his sales didn't change much, but now he had $1 million of sales, but he had like 850 k of expenses. So now at least he's got 150 k instead of $1 or, or whatever it was to say like, okay, I'm, I'm still working hard, but I have something to show for it. Yeah. In, well, in sales, we used to call that kind of like, um, you know, looking back at your deals for the year mm -hmm. and then figuring out kind of what was the most profitable deal and then just kind of working. How can I emulate this and then replicate it? Time and time and time again. But from the sounds of it, it sounds to me that this is sort of like a true CFO kind of dissecting of the business of figuring out, okay, well, based on your profit margin, this here has the most profit. This here has the least amount of profit. Let's get rid of this somehow and implode this a lot more. Exactly. Because as a business owner, you sometimes get stuck in the operations, you know, every day there's a fire to put out. This employee called in sick. Like I have a client, construction company. If someone calls in sick, he's literally driving the drum truck. You know, like, yeah, like yeah. instead of being the owner, high level, managing everything. If someone calls in sick, he's got to like that drives the truck. If the dump truck deliveries don't happen, the business is going to like come to a halt. So, so that's, yeah, that's the whole idea about, like, to me, that kind of feels like the whole idea about uh, being able to outsource a service like this, that CFO service, if you will. Um, it gives you that sort of look at future proofing, not just future proofing. Like you're not necessarily looking right in front of you. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're, you're looking ahead. You're driving with your window wide open, not necessarily just driving and hoping that you're not going to hit the next bump in the road. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's a lot of the times I find a lot of the, the businesses are just kind of operating from that place of, I got to get this done. I got to get this done. But, but there's no sense of, well, what are we going to do next year, 10 years from now, five years from now? And that's where services like this, I feel like you guys would be best serve or serving the clients like that. We're, we're trying to balance both the day to day, because obviously what's happening today is important with the long term. Mm -hmm. So, so in many ways, there's like a saying, you might've heard it before, like, we're doing some things as if we're going to live forever. We're doing some things as if we're going to die tomorrow. Yeah. So, you know, that, that that's a saying I've heard many times in different contexts, but we're kind of being mindful of both of those things. Like, like we hope this is going to be going on for a long time. So as a result, we need to think long-term and put those things in practice. It's actually a hadith. It is. It, it, is. Is. it is. Do for your life as if you're living forever. Uh, sorry, as if you're living forever and then do for your end as if you're dying tomorrow. Exactly. That's basically it. Yeah, exactly. And then I'm glad you brought this up. I really like that uh, saying up. It's, it's kind of like the mantra. Yeah, hundred percent. And, and I appreciate in order to get to that point, you have to get through today. Mm -hmm. So if you're like employee called in sick and that's going to create a problem, you have to dive, drive the dump truck. Okay. Like, like we got to address problem A yeah. to worry about problem X because that's way down the priority list or, or not as immediate attention, but let's think about getting some systems in place. Let's think about some high level stuff so that you're not always caught up in these fires, you know, high level, big picture. And, and another thing is what's the most profitable thing you could be doing? You know, like, like that's another concept yeah. and, and, and theory that like, we don't want, like a really good example is like, we don't want to get you stuck sitting in a pile of receipts and organizing them. You know, some, some business owners oh, think like, I'm already sweating thinking of that. <laughs> and then that was actually like my last year when I, when I was talking to you and you're like, Oh no, no, just don't worry about it. Just send it over. I was like, thank God. Right. Because it used to take me at least three weeks, four weeks to get my taxes done by myself. And I'm talking like three, four hours a day, at least every day. And you, and you things owner. you could be doing. Exactly. You could be like, social media, marketing, uh, cold calling, door knocking, um, Something. And this is what I was saying. Like I keep bringing that term outsourcing a service or outsourcing uh, a specific portion of the business to someone else. Uh, a lot of the times we're just so like, we just want to guard it. We want to hold it back and we, like nobody can do it better than me. Sure. To a certain extent, because obviously you know your business better. However, sometimes I'd rather someone does it. And I'm not saying that you guys do, but I'd rather someone does it at 70% in quarter of the time than me doing it at a hundred percent. And I have nothing else, no time for, for something else to do in my business. That's more important. Exactly. So, so it, it's all about what's the most profitable thing you could be doing. Yeah. To me, if we use the example of bookkeeping, bookkeeping has a cost. There's, there's people that work on an hourly basis or monthly fixed fee basis. Yeah. Let's say that cost is here. Most business owners and what they sell and what they produce 
And if they spend time on business development, if they spend time on sales, if they spend time on that, the value we can attribute to that is going to be higher. It's going to be, in many cases, multiple times higher. Exactly. You know, the bookkeeping rate might be $50 an hour. The business owner for their business development work, finding new clients, doing that type of work might be two, three hundred dollars an hour. Might be more, infinite. And this actually brings me to like another point that I was trying to make with a friend of mine the other day about having or hiring an assistant or having an assistant working for you. And you know, the the point that I was trying to bring across is not about you know, it's not about like just that look. I have an assistant or you know that sort of bouginess, if you will. It's more about well, no, what I pay her is a lot cheaper than my hourly rate. And with that being said, I know she's going to get it done a, a lot better than I would because that's her job. That's her focus versus me trying to do the paperwork and do all of that stuff when I could be focusing on activities that are going to produce more business. So 100%. for my business, for example, the most activity producing or the, the activities that I, I think are have the highest price tag is me connecting with clients, mm -hmm. talking to clients, going on coffees. If I can do that and have someone else do the paperwork, or I can do that and have someone else do the accounting, or I can do that and have someone else doing the marketing, that's really where my business is going to take off to the next level. I agree. And when you get people doing what they're good at, the work also becomes more enjoyable. So I'll use myself as an example. I love talking to people. I love the being out and about. I love the networking piece. Many accountants aren't like that. Many accountants like to be technical in the numbers. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about beyond networking, some people will say to me, they're like, I've never met an outgoing accountant or friendly accountant. But what I tell people is because that's my the most friendly accounting I've ever met in my life. <laughs> but because I'm that way and I know that I'm really good at getting clients, bringing in yeah. people to the, the office. Obviously, work needs to get done. Some of that work I do. But I have colleagues that are, in terms of their skill set, very good at technical work, but maybe not necessarily as interested in bringing in the work. So if we just have an example of two people, if one person can bring in the work and one person can do the work, you have a really good team because in theory, they can't operate without each other. If one person's really good at doing work, but they can't find any work, nothing's going to come in for yeah. them to do. So they're literally going to be the genius, but they're going to be sitting without anything to do. And if you have the other person who's really good at finding work, but not very good at doing it, they're going to find all this work, but not be able to do it. The clients are going to get upset. They're going to leave. So in, in, in my really simple example, we have people in my office that are kind of really, really good at doing work. Very, very technically sound, very, very strong. And I work with them really well because I find them some clients and say, you know, we, we have this new lead. I've, I've got this stuff organized for you. It's, it's ready to go. Here you go. And then they're like, boom, they take it from there. Yeah. It sounds like the, the saying that I keep hearing comes up time and time again. If you want to go faster, you go by yourself. But if you want to go further, you go with a team. 100%. I like that. It's uh, I mean, we have another saying back home. Actually, it's uh, it's kind of it's Egyptian, kind of funny. It's like one hand by itself can't clap. That's true. You know what I mean? Yeah, so that's like, true. I can try to do this, but the second I do that, then you and I can clap. Hundred percent. Yeah, and, and that's really like what I like about this is that look. At the end of the day, you have to figure out the way to to kind of bring the business and grow the business in a way. And sometimes you within the business are not able to see further than the next day. Mm -hmm. And it's it's always good to have a second opinion or a second sort of look at the business to kind of figure out where, where you're at. Um, so how would we bring people to you guys? What would be the best way to contact you? What would be the best way to, uh, to kind of get in touch with you? So we have a website, pattersonandcompany.ca. I have an email address, which, you know, I can, I, you have, so you can share with your Absolutely, yeah. followers and viewers. That's probably the best way. I'm on LinkedIn, Sarwar Qureshi. If anyone wants to reach out and send me a connection request, I'd say any of those options are the best way. And then from there, depending on people's preference, we can meet at my office, we can meet at their office, we can meet for coffee, we can meet virtually. And that's kind of the starting point, like I said, of seeing if there's something we can help with. So I have a question that's a little bit sort of, I'd, I'd like to kind of end with it, uh, if you will. Um, as an accountant, what would be like a... Again, at the end of the day, people are going to choose the, the accountant or the, the service provider that's, that they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. But what would you say would be the best 10 to 15 things that, or maybe, maybe not, but like the best couple of things that they should look for in an accountant before they hire them? That's a good question. 
So I'd say number one is fit slash chemistry. So when you're working with someone, any service provider, it doesn't have to be accountant, could be lawyer, could be mortgage, real estate, whatever it is, you have to get along with the person. So if you feel like you do, that's a good sign because you're going to be dealing with this person maybe for years to come. Yeah. Like I said earlier, I've been dealing with people for 15, 16 years and hopefully many more years to come. So if part of that feels like it's forced or you, have some, issue, off, yeah. you have some issue with it, then that's fine. Like some people tell me straight up, they're like, I want someone that speaks this language because they feel comfortable in that language. I have no problem with that. Like I don't speak French. Someone wants to speak French. I have a colleague that does. Boom, we can connect you. Um, or whatever whatever the reason is. Some people want to work with uh, females. Some people want to work with uh, this ethnicity. Some people want to work with this specialist. By all means. So connectivity, fit is probably important. The other thing I think is very important is clear, transparent pricing. Yeah. Sometimes I hear stories where like people get a quote or they don't get a quote at all. And then Surprise. they get surprised that my quote was this, my bill was this, or I didn't get a quote. Now I got the bill and I wasn't expecting that. So I think it's very, very important. Like, Transparency. Like when sure. I drop a car off at the mechanic, they tell me what they're going to do and how much it's going to cost. And they say, if anything else comes up, we'll call you and we'll let you know. And you have to give us the go ahead on the phone. Yeah. And we can even tell you if it's a must or you can delay it, that you can do this next time. Mm -hmm. So then I'm, I'm, I'm in complete knowledge and control. So if there's any issues or discrepancies with pricing, if there's any of these like overages or, or fees that don't make sense, to me, that's not good business practice. To me, that's, that's you know, something that I would be looking for. The other thing is timeliness. Some accountants get so busy, they get so bogged down that everything becomes deadline oriented. Well, deadlines are months out. So if let's say we're talking about something for this year, and we're dealing with it at the deadline time for corporations, it's six months out. Well, we're halfway into the new year. If we realize there were some issues with the pricing, with the expenses, and we're waiting till the deadline to figure that out, well, half the year of the upcoming year has gone by, and now we're dealing with it. We want to be more proactive, not reactive. Yeah. So I had a conversation this morning on the way here. I do a lot of Bluetooth calls in the car. And the person was telling me their business year end was December 31st. They almost have their stuff ready. And I said to them, it's, it's only January, whatever the date is today, let's tackle it. You know, if you have stuff ready by Monday, I'll have someone on my team ready. And you know, that way, if we notice anything in those numbers for 2023, it's only the second or third week of January. You can, you can implement that for 2024 on a fresh basis. Yeah. And that's, that's actually the biggest, what the biggest issue is like you go in, you're trying to do taxes. I'm, I'm a huge prep, prep. like. ADHD. At the end of the day, I approximate, like I don't do things with the time I'm supposed to be doing it. So for example, my taxes last year were way behind knowing that this year I need to implement a few things. It was a little too late. So it's always a good point to be able to just kind of do it when it's supposed to be done. Yeah. To me, proactive rather than reactive. And the last one more point I'll add to that is some people feel the accountants they work with are very, I'll call it compliance oriented. What I mean by that is the client gives the stuff to the accountant, the accountant gives the taxes back, sign here, and that's it. So some accountants are not offering the advice piece. Nothing wrong with that because that's for yeah. some people what they're looking for, for some businesses. But it's important that if you as a business owner want the advice, it should be more of a process of here's my stuff. And then the accountant is having a conversation, having a meeting, having some questions and deep dives of like, why do you sell this product? It doesn't make a lot of money. And maybe there's a reason for it. You yeah. know, like, like there's this saying where grocery stores sell milk because it gets the people in the store, but maybe they lose money on it, but the milk is in the way back. So when you go to get the milk and then you go through all the aisles and you come to the front and they have all the high value stuff kind of along the way, you pick up a couple other items. So then it's like, okay, I understand. You got to offer that to get this other stuff as part of the exactly. the total package. So I really like the point that you made earlier, and I'm just going to bring it up just to kind of sum this up a little bit. Um, being the virtual CFO or the actual CFO of the business, when you have a small, medium business like this, you want an accountant to be able to tell you no. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what I like about Sauer is like, he's not, you know, he's one of those people that will tell you no if it means it's going to hurt your business uh, or a yes. And you should do it and then to force you to do it because at the end of the day, it makes sense. And, and that's really what I I'd be looking for in an accountant, someone that's going to be able to hold me accountable 
But in the same token, when I'm making a bad decision to say, no, you're not making that decision. That's going to hurt your business in this way, in this way, in this way. And here's the remedy for it. Here's what we should do to fix it. And that's really what a true CFO is, is like someone that's going to be able to hold you accountable. And in the so same token, be kind of like the, you know, hold the whip a little bit if it needs to be. Yeah, I, I learned early in my career. I have, I have one small story where I was inexperienced. So maybe I didn't push back as much, but I had this client and he had one store and he thought it was a good idea to expand because his one store was super successful. So logically, you would open a second store. Yeah. This guy was really big picture. He decided to open two more stores at the same time mm -hmm. in different parts of the city, right? So we're talking downtown, Bell's Corners, and then uh, Orleans, you know, one store to three all at once. So he's basically tripling his business and tripling his profit, tripling everything. And I was kind of very early in my career. So I was kind of just excited about, you know, the opportunities and, and working with him. And I kind of was at, at that stage kind of like, okay, let's, let's, let's see what happens or, or this sounds great. Yeah. And I learned, and, and what he learned was his first store was really, really successful because he was giving it the attention and detail and he was there all the time that when he had three stores and he's not at all the three stores in the same amount of time and detail, they're not as profitable. And because he's running between the stores, the first store wasn't as profitable either because he's not spending all his time there anymore either. Yeah. So it ultimately worked out for him in a, in a way that wasn't as imagined, like it wasn't as profitable, but it was still profitable. But we learned that maybe it could have been more managed, that maybe he should have done one at a time or had better processes in place that, you know, thinking too big, not to say there's anything bad about that, but you got to have systems in place. And, and we well, that's the thing too. Like you got to grow at a rate that's profitable, but also that it's not hindering the business in a way. And that's what sustainable. essentially, yeah, yeah. it's, it's got to be sustainable. It's so interesting talking to Sarah. I could talk to him for hours. We still text every day. We, we, like literally I would talk to him more than he would talk to his wife sometimes, which is, <laughs> it's insane. With that being said, we... I feel like we are missing this massive thing here, which we didn't talk about, but I'd love to bring you back on the show again for another episode. Sure. Because what Sarwar does on the networking side, I haven't seen anywhere in Ottawa, anyone that can do it this well. And I'd really appreciate you coming here. Really appreciate it. you being on the show. Guys, really appreciate it. If you love the show, please hit us up. Give us the like, subscribe. And this guy here, Better to join his networking events that are fantastic. If you want to hire an accountant, he's one of the best in the city. And I know we didn't get into to talk a little bit more about Ottawa and what have you, but that's probably going to be on the next episode when we talk be, about the yeah, networking event. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to see more of these, please hit the like button and subscribe. And thank you again. Really appreciate it.